We're going to get started. Today is Monday, March 28th, 2016. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, we have called to order approval of minutes from February 22nd. Oh, so moved. Thank you. I can't second. I wasn't here. You can. You, can. you just can. You can second. They you look just... good. I'll second them. Okay. <laughs> but now you would like, if you'd like to abstain, you can. But you don't um, have to. But you don't have to. All in favor? Aye. I'll say aye. Aye. Heather, would you like to abstain? Yes. Okay. Any adjustments? No. Zipping right along, District Strategy Progress Report is our first presentation. Yes, and that is in your packet. Yep. Um, the only thing I want to call your attention to is uh, information under B Management and Operations. Um, so we have updated all water quality and testing reports. We just did an additional report at Hadley Elementary School and tested all sinks. It's also on schedule to be tested again through the town this summer, and we'll do faucets and sinks. Everything came out well, and our asbestos testing, um, there are some issues to be addressed, but there's nothing um, significant. And the way that we know that is that we are given a year, actually, yeah, an entire year to address um, some of the, to contain um, some of the asbestos issues. And we will start, we have already started working on some of that with the majority of, we'll be taken care of in the summer and then we'll send a progress report but to But that's only the state. over here, isn't it? Correct. Okay. Um, that's over here at Hopkins. And those reports are available for the public to view in the superintendent's office. And, and do you want to show <laughs> you want to show people the black notebook while we're talking about this? Oh, sure. This has nothing to do with the asbestos <laughs> report. No, no, not the asbestos report, but the district <laughs> strategy progress report. This is kind of a. Oh, okay. You know so, what I mean? so um, in order to assist the committee when it comes time for end of cycle evaluation, which will occur in July, I have collected a number of artifacts to demonstrate progress. So artifacts connected with things that you've received in your school committee packets over the past year, but they're all in one place and they are organized according to the standards for effective practice. And so that will be available in my office too, but we, are, we won't be doing that until July as a committee. It looks really cool. Okay. School, are we done with that? Yes. School choice. So your school choice recommendations were in your packets. What you see are the recommendations by each principal, the number of slots they would like to make available for school choice. Um, in kindergarten, Mr. Udall is recommending that we make four slots available <coughs> in grade one, two slots available, six slots available for grade two, so this is next year's grade two, none in grade three, none in grade four, five in grade five, and none in grade six for a total of 17 slots at Hadley Elementary School. Next to each of the slot recommendations, you see the current enrollment of the grade um, that we would be adding slots to. Does anyone have any questions about the elementary recommendations? I do. I assume that the grade five adding five when the enrollment is already 55 means we'd like to go to three classrooms. We have three. We in have the current three. grade four. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nice. Hi, Humeris. Are we started oh, without no, you? No worries. I'm late. Any other questions about elementary? Nope. And the slots that Mr. Beck is recommending, again, based on um, looking at our current enrollment, enrollment for incoming grades, he's recommending opening seven slots, excuse me, 11 slots for grade seven, six for grade eight. 17 for grade nine. In grade nine, we have uh, a pretty substantial exodus out to Smith Vocational, anticipated for next year. Uh, five slots for grade 10, 14 for 11, and eight for grade 12. But we don't really expect to get many kids for 11 and 12. We don't typically. Uh, Hopkins, the elementary school, we are typically always wait listing for elementary slots in the lower grades, in the lower grades. and in the Seven through twelve, we always have available slots. Questions on that? Anyone? No. That does. We can wait until action. That does require a um, vote 
from the oh, school right. committee annually. You want to do it now or later? I'm I'm do it now. It now. Now. Okay. And this is to approve the, approve school choice. And do we have to clarify we we are approving it in both schools, or does it not matter? I think your vote to say that you're approving school choice slots as presented, um, then this is made available as presented okay. in the school committee packet. This is made available um, to the public, and we report each grade to okay. the Department of Ed. Okay. Um, I can make a motion then to approve the 2016-2017 school choice seats available as presented in the packet, of which totals uh, 78 spots. That's a lot. Second. Thank you. Any, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. Thank you. Moving right along to our special educator and Hess principal search options. Congratulations, Mr. Udall. We will miss you, but I am I am one who looks forward to retirement. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I appreciate it. I have thoroughly enjoyed my five years here. Um, it's been a pleasure to be here and an honor to be here. Um, I can't speak highly enough about the Hadley Elementary staff. Um, it is the most collegial and hardworking group of uh, teachers that I've ever had the opportunity to lead. And um, I do this with mixed emotions because um, I like what I do, and we have great kids and a huge, you know, tremendously supportive community. Um, and you know that Hadley is a, a very well thought of school district and a desirable place to have children attend. Um, but with some more, some more, <laughs> more surgeries I'm facing, I'd like to be able to walk one day normally and without pain. Um, I made the decision to think it's time. I'm at a point in my career after 38 years, where I'm 18 years as a principal, um, I need to think about help. So I thank you all for your support as well during my tenure. So that's it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. We'll miss you. Good luck. So why don't we start with uh, special education? We have two parents from the Special Education Parent Advisory Council, and one of them. Ms. Berger, Bruver is the co-chair of the CPAC this evening. So CPAC saw this graphic also and um, weighed in on it. And the feedback from the Special Education Parent Advisory Council was included in the school committee packet. So they had a chance to review it. So we're looking at two big options. One, maintaining our current organizational structure, which essentially is one administrator in this case, overseeing special education and a variety of student service functions. So Ms. Bell leads English language learners, um, uh, Title I, I knew there was another title, I'm sorry. Title Three English language learners, Title I, so targeted academic interventions for students who um, are eligible for that. In addition to that, uh, oversees homeschool, um, early childhood, and I'm sure I'm forgetting things right now. We have one administrator doing a lot in addition to running special education. And this maintaining our current organizational structure, we could simply keep it exactly as it is. Um, and I identified this is, this is not meant to be exhaustive by any stretch of the imagination. It's only meant to be a conversation starter. So the advantage to that is this is originally the school committee's recommendation to um, organize it this way. Um, the con is the position as it's currently structured is just, it's, an, it's unmanageable, it's an unmanageable workload for somebody who is experienced, talented, and intelligent, and so I can't see how it would be better um, if we just maintained it as it is. Uh, another option is to modify the position to special education administrator, so the new administrator only focuses on special education, um, but it would require other duties to be assigned to staff, either in a stipended capacity, like to have a Title I coordination function, a Title III coordination function, a stipended coordinator positions. Title uh, I, Title III. Title I, targeted academic intervention. Title III, English language learners, uh, early education and care. So pre-K, we do have a pre-K, we have an early education. Nursing? And care. Yeah, nursing um, Assistant superintendent. I see. That's face to face with the families yeah. in the curriculum, and I supervise them and their parent outreach and um, 
just make sure then the NIAC accreditation is handled through the um, principal's office. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although in some cases, early education and care to some extent is a special education program yes, and service, yes. so it may be something is that program. it's a special ed program. So if it were an administrator of special education, it may still very well fall under special education because we have a, one of the teachers is the director of the program for early education and care. And stripping off of the, those responsibilities would do what in terms of number of hours of work? How many hours a week are you working? And if we move those off, what would we, would you be working a normal workload? She has a cot in the back of her office. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I have keys to get in on the weekend. Um, okay, so the next question is, is the job is 50 to 6 hours, to 60 hours a week. Okay. And would taking those off reduce it by 10 to 20? So that you'd be at a 40 hour a week? Well, conceivably, yeah, Title III is um, just on the horizon of being a huge right. demand. Right. And so it's been a demand for like a year and a half, two years. It's increasingly so. Um, so that one, even though we might have a low incidence of kids that you know are not native English speakers, the bureaucratic paperwork that goes with it and the audits and the reporting has just continued to mount and it requires um, a new level of supervising all teachers oh, right. to implement the Title III NIDA standards of instruction. So that's not going to, if that were somehow managed, it's a big job, but it's, um, you know, it, it could be divvied out in different ways that might impact a principal's responsibilities as well. Um, I know Celine could do some of the, um, Record keeping as well uh, with uh, part of her job. You know, she were stipend to do more of that kind of take on that kind of responsibility. Um, we are part of a consortium because our incidence has to be a hundred students before we get to file a loan for our Title III grants, and so that takes up a certain amount of hours. I go to those meetings; they're pretty essential right now. But that might be something that Celine would enjoy being part of because it really does encompass the whole gamut. But um, again, I don't know that, 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 you know, who knows personnel-wise whether that would be something you can count on. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Title I is similar. I do a lot of the, just the record keeping for Title I in terms of meeting all the state compliance, doing the grants, managing amendments and things like that with um, uh, the day-to-day -day operation that is a very competent teacher. Yep. Whether she'd be interested in spending some of her time to be stipend to take on more of those responsibilities, <clears throat> it would be a normal thing to ask. I mean, she might do that. So. Um, so these are conjecture, of course. Right. I, don't, I can't tell you. Right. But definitely having less things to do would help make it more manageable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think when we went out the last time, the recommendation was to have it be the assistant superintendent to increase the number of candidates. That the feeling then was that just advertising for a SPED director would not get us sufficient candidates. Oh. That was part of the thinking last time. Oh. I, couldn't, I didn't remember that. I'm sorry, Ruby, I couldn't hear you very well. I'm sorry. Uh, part of our thinking was to, that if we just advertised for a SPED director, you wouldn't necessarily get enough applicants, and that it would be more appealing for people if it was an assistant superintendent position. And so that's part of the reason it was recommended and structured the way it was. Okay. And also, things have changed significantly since mm -hmm. three years ago in terms of the demands on that office of people personnel. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And another big kind of overarching option is to revise our current structure to include a full-time, the language we've been talking about is this language of coordinator. We haven't developed a job description for this. Um, it's more important to understand for the, for the purpose of having a discussion what we mean by that. So somebody who would really be dedicated to four 
critical functions when we talk about coordination. One is acting as a team chair for the district. So the advantage to that now is that very often teachers are chairing team meetings. That takes away from their time in the classroom. Sometimes it's not a teacher. Sometimes it's a related service provider who's the liaison or the person who's chairing that meeting. So when they're chairing meetings, they're not providing those services that they're hired to provide. Um, if the advantage to having an individual, and there are districts that have team chairs, team coordinators. Um, again, Hatfield has a full-time coordinator. The advantage to that is it, that you get um, also the advantage of having greater consistency in your individual education plans. That's not to imply that we have any issues with our individual education plans. It's just that the person that's dedicated to facilitating a team meeting and writing those plans, um, we can really zero in on that kind of professional development. There are resources available through the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education that are designed to help people to facilitate meetings more effectively and to design and write IEPs that are high quality, standards-based, and really goal-oriented with tight measurements in them. I think it's um, a lot to expect that people whose primary responsibility is either teaching and or providing related services would also be experts at writing IEPs and facilitating meetings. So chairing meetings, writing IEPs, um, and uh, to the, depending on the qualifications of the person who is hired, uh, doing assessments that they were qualified to do, doing assessments particularly for eligibility determination. So when there's a referral into special education, there are certain assessments that we have to do depending on the nature of the referral. And typically, it's an entire battery of assessments so we can ascertain if, a, if there is, in fact, a disability and the extent to which that disability impacts a student's ability to access the general curriculum. So depending on the qualifications of the person hired for the coordinator position. For example, if they were a classroom educator, they could do educational assessments. Again, doing assessments, particularly for initial el eligibility determinations and for three-year re-evals, take a considerable amount of time. And that means time away from the classroom. If the qualifications of the coordinator were something else, it is likely that they would still be qualified to do some sort of assessments, depending on what their background is. Well, if they had minimally a special ed certification, they could do a lot of the assessments for academic standing and reading right. skills. And, um, they could not do a psychological report, right? but they could do many, many other, um, um, the ones that we mm -hmm. traditionally do. Right. However, if for some reason we had first, for some reason a speech path applied for this position, that person would be qualified to do different kinds of assessment. A school site could do intelligence testing. It, yeah. um, and, uh, and also another component uh, that we see kind of as a, a central function of this would be uh, parent and family engagement. Um, and so that's what we're thinking of when we talk about a full-time coordinator. One option within that is to do what Hatfield has done, hire a full-time coordinator, have the superintendent assume the SPED administration role, which is what Hatfield does. Another option is... That's the part-time special education administrator? Uh, no, that's no the, the first, this box right here. What, can you go back before? It's still, they're all part-time special education administration. That's so you don't have asking. it. You don't, so, so I'm sorry, you have 1.0. This 1. position yeah, is, your, is, is option one, 1 is you do it. Yes, of that. So okay. A, B, and then one, two, three under it, if that's how you're okay. doing it. Um, another option is to hire a full-time coordinator and have a contracted service provider. Examples of that include TMS. TMS provides business services. TMS also provides special education administration services. Um, collaborative for Educational Services. Pat and I met with CES. They certainly would be um, willing to either share a position with us or provide uh, hourly an hourly rate for time, or Futures Health Corps. I have also had conversations with Pat about her willingness to perhaps provide these services um, in retirement, and she has indicated that she would be willing to do that to assist us, uh, particularly while we make a transition. Another option within that is to still hire a full-time coordinator and share a special education administrator with another district um, or with CES. So either we're paying them on a, as a contracted service provider or we're actually taking one person's contract and saying, you're taking point point 0.4 of this person and we're taking point 0.6 of this person. Can you talk about what this position would do? 
You've, you've told us of the four primary tasks of the full-time coordinator. What's the administrator doing? The special education administrator. So in terms of meetings, at this point, we'd recommend that still um, checking in for initial eligibility meetings for three-year reevaluation meetings. The special education administrator in every district is responsible by law for out-of-district monitoring of students. So all of our districts who are all of our students who are placed in approved out of district placements. Currently, Ms. Bell is responsible for visiting those placements and monitoring those educational plans. Um, certainly, ensuring that uh, all of our coordinated program reviews, our program quality assurance, so CPR, PQA, all of our audits are that we're meeting those standards set forth in our audits, that we're submitting all of our plans on time, all of our corrective action plans on time. Um, and uh, certainly would have sort of ultimate supervisory responsibility to ensure that if there was any ever any issues or questions that came up as a result of an IEP meeting or if families had some questions about um, what was going on in terms of coordination. Also, we've talked about um, we, with under Pat's leadership, created a new program at Hadley Elementary School. So some of that administrator work would involve evaluating our existing programs to evaluate the extent to which we're achieving the objectives that we that we initially set forth, and also to evaluate the needs across the district of what other programs we may want to consider building. So that's part of doing that analysis of where we're losing students to out of district placements and what more might we be able to offer in-house or in partnership with other nearby districts. That's not an exhaustive list, but that's just some things. Can I keep asking questions? Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, you said that the full-time coordinator position would minimally have SPED certification. What's the requirements of the part-time special education administrator? They'd have to be in possession of a special education administrator license issued by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed. It's a specific license. The full-time coordinator may have special ed certification in terms of teaching. It may they may be a licensed school psychologist. They may um, they may have other they may have a different certification. And in this model, who's doing Title One? Uh, so either either it could be something that uh, the special education administrator is doing as part of student services. Although I would still evaluate whether or not there are teachers who are who are interested in doing that work and there might be an option for them to have more leadership and to be remunerated for that. And the Title III? Same thing, around those stipends. So we have a Title I dedicated teacher, so I would, I would say in Title I and Title III that we might want to look at um, if we have, if those educators would in fact like to take on more administrative, more of an administrative role. Early education and care is, is a special education program, so that falls under the special education administrator. In terms of nursing, that could that could fall under me. We have a director of nursing. We have a nurse leader, rather, in this district. So we have a nurse in each building, and we have a nurse leader in the district as well, part-time nurse leader. And what about the financial implications of each of these? I don't see anything. So it would depend on what, um, Folks, what folks were hired at. But I would say that the greatest cost savings, so maintaining the current organizational structure, then it's, there's, you're looking at the same financial impact roughly. You can just assume it's somewhere within the same financial impact. So if we go to something can I, else. Before you say that, if, if we went with the current organizational structure but modified the position, and gave teachers Title I and Title III, does that increase their responsibilities enough to increase their salaries? It would, you would have to stipend them. So it's a them. little more, no matter what, even if we go with option one. If we go with option 1B, there's a bit more cost. There could very well be. OK. It depends on what um, you would advertise the special education administrator at. It would dictate how much of a okay. difference it would make once you start stipending additional responsibilities. And then under the second larger option, so if you simply go with a full-time coordinator and the superintendent assumes the special education administration role, you could have um, a pretty sizable amount of savings. Um, it would really depend on what, where the full-time coordinator landed, but you could potentially, uh, you could potentially see 
$20,000 in savings there. Um, in the second option, um, in the second and the third option underneath that, you may have a relative, you may see some, you may see some savings there, um, but you may see a, that the cost impact is, is neutral. Um, and I, certainly we're always hopeful that we can become more efficient and, and save money. But even if the impact were neutral, you've gained capacity. So you've gone from a capacity of 1.0 to 1. Point whatever the part time is for essentially. So you've increased your capacity for probably a negligible cost impact. And did you not do a 2D, which would be just having one and a half people do within our staff? And when you say that, um, that we have a full-time coordinator and a part-time administrator that is not you, is not contracted out, and is not shared. So you could certainly do that, and I would say then that it probably will be uh, somewhat similar to um, your second option there. It'd be run pretty close to contracted services. Do you want me to stop asking questions now so other people can? And some of, I'm sorry, you have the folks out there who want to also. Would there be an advantage to your 2D over the contracted service? I don't know the answer. Okay. That's why I asked. Yeah. Well, one of the things that having a contracted service provider, uh, Pat and I have talked about this a bit. I mean, certainly if this were something that, that Ms. Bell could assist with, there's some clear advantages to some consistency as we decide what we want to do going forward. So a contracted services provider, we haven't hired somebody that then, which would happen even if we shared a position with someone, that um, that we may look at doing things differently. It may change somewhat. Um, part of what we talked about, and I talked about with the other co-chair of CPAC, I talked about with Ms. Label, was um, how much work the CPAC is doing to really learn more about effective models of special education delivery. There were a few members of CPAC that went to, was that a national conference or a statewide conference you all went to in Boston? Uh, the um, Federation for Children with Special Needs put it on. And so there are certainly opportunities for us to collaborate with CPAC closely and get some ideas about what are other districts doing that we might want to emulate. What are some models of service delivery that we think we might want to adopt or try out? And so using contracted services gives you a little more flexibility in terms of increasing or decreasing time as needed. But there's no, I don't think there's one clear advantage. The only thing about a contract with service to any of those other independent mm -hmm. business type sources is you do pay administrative costs over the cost of the personnel hours. Mm -hmm. Outsourcing doesn't always save money. <clears throat> it's the mantra of the Franklin Regional Council of Government. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I assume that you are hoping for our thoughts soon because we need to move on this. Correct. And this is something, so the town, special education is a responsibility of a town, really, by law. It's not even listed as responsibility of the school district. It's responsibility of the town's responsibility, legal and fiscal. And the hiring of special education directors is a responsibility of a school committee. Um, so any movement in this absolutely requires um, school committee direction. And Pat, do you see if we went with 2B, um, does, would you see that as advantageous, especially if it was you, so that we could see how the divvying up of responsibilities helps both in maintain, if not improve, quality of service, but also relieve staff stress, share responsibilities? Is that kind of the... Well, I, I have advocated for a model like that, not as, even before I came to think that I just wanted to do 60 hours every week, um, that I'm familiar with the other model where we had a team chair person that handled a lot of the responsibilities on the ground day by day things, 
and then in the role as special education director, I myself then had a whole other basket that I could devote more attention to. And um, so what that does is free up, in this case, I think we really have an impact on teaching um, hours, if we're able to take the responsibility of writing IEPs and collecting all that data and putting it's all the bureaucratic level of IEPs that has to happen into someone else's hands other than a service provider, you really benefit children. So that's the part of that model I really do like. Um, and having the uh, skills to be able to do assessments as well, as well as another benefit because that's another real draw on time for teachers when they have to do assessments and they have to stop seeing kids to get assessments in because we have a large enough caseload that nobody has hours of free time <laughs> to be doing these other duties. So I do see that as a real advantage in general for that model. Um, I personally would be invested in continuing on in that role for um, at the time being because I have initiated a lot of things that I'd love to see really fully developed and implemented well because I think we see evidence of success in their implementation um, at this point, but they're new. <laughs> so it's, it's hard to pass the baton when you've you know, invested a lot in making change and trying to get that to be really become institutional practice that's effective. So I do have some investment in some of the activities that you know, I've shared with Jeff and Brian to date and would love um, to see those come to fruition. Um, I, I also am very open to working on a part-time basis. So the, having um, the advantage of maybe helping the elementary school through another transition without having to change every other aspect of the functioning of the building is something that that might have an advantage to keeping my um, foot in there for another time. And I also feel like um, the, you know, I worry about the morale of the faculty in the building that when they heard both of us were leaving were not happy about that. And um, so if, if it provided some sense of security for keeping the status quo, for the sake of the faculty, I thought that that was a useful thing because they've been through a lot of changes. So, but this this model, this is also going to have stipended Title One, Title Three come out, also, correct? But we we think. Really that. I think it sounds other, like it's right. if there's yeah, teachers interested. Yeah, and, and part of what that's not part of the model that you're suggesting I, necessarily. I think that, that's still something that needs to be hashed out. Andy right. and I got locked together for about eight hours last week. We did. So we <laughs> talked a lot about some of this. On the Is that why you're wearing the same color today? Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. we now dress alike. Yes, yeah. it was, it was a good ride. But. Um, but it was not, we didn't get to all the little details because that is, there are other areas that I know would need some conversation yeah. to really flush out exactly what those responsibilities, mm -hmm. not the least of which is educator evaluation responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So some of those would still need to be handled. Mm -hmm. Some of what we had discussed along those lines, Roby, is that um, if, that also offers an opportunity to see for a period of time what is reasonable to um, have for me to do, right? Which of those do they all need to be stipended? What's reasonable for me to do? Um, and uh, what isn't reasonable for me to do? So. I would caution, and I think I've mentioned this to Annie clearly. I, I think for Annie to assume all the responsibilities of a special education director is pretty unreasonable and I'm glad you're your Whichever way we should be moving our heads, we agree with you. I feel it's a considerably smaller district than we are, even though we are a tiny district. They are teeny tiny. And, and we have out of district needs that require a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. Right. And I spent a lot of hours on that. So, yep. um, yeah. Um, I'm certainly not advocating for that. I did feel it was my responsibility to explore every option, so that's why I told you I'd be meeting with Hatfield, and I met with 
Mr. Ro with John Robertson with Michelle to talk about their model. And Roby's absolutely right. They're about half the size in total enrollment. They have uh, 10 fewer students on plans. They have roughly the same student number of students on plans. They're half the size in total enrollment. And uh, as I said, Pat and I met with Futures Health Corps. Pat and I met with the Collaborative for Educational Services. We had a long meeting in the car, the two of us. Um, and I had forgotten to list TMS, uh, the management solution, also um, currently does the contracting for Ware and Granby for Special Education Administration. Well, my feeling is 1A is out. Yeah. yeah. That did, it was an experiment that we realized wasn't right. doable. Right. And I don't, it seems 1B doesn't really increase our capacity. And so that's mm -hmm. not no, great. No. Right. Well, 2A, I really don't think Annie has the time right. to do that. 2B, I like a lot, especially if it's Pat. Yeah, I like well, the yeah. continuity aspect mm -hmm. of So when, yeah. when districts run into trouble with their SPED programs, I wonder about outsourcing and, um, li that, that's, I don't know if your liability is exactly the right word, but, you know, it's, it's something that you are not in direct control of, and the state comes in and says, wow, this is really lousy, and I, I I'm not entirely comfortable with just outsourcing it to a private party. Agreed. Without knowing more about what kind of uh, responsibility. Well, I think there are probably models to investigate that would give you good insight. Um, yeah. And if you did lean towards that middle option, there'd be. Um, I do know that um, you are allowed to hire me as a retiree. Right. 960 hours a year or something right. like that. And I, there are some little paperwork I have to do, mm -hmm. but I don't think it impacts what you are entitled to do. Right. Anyone I like else? that option as well, especially, mm -hmm. especially if Pat is able to serve as continuity for the faculty and also help build capacity in individuals who could take on some of those Title I and III responsibilities. Mm -hmm. I think it makes a lot of sense. To be, and we encourage a, rela a strong relationship with Pat Bell. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. And now we move to options for the hiring of the Hadley Elementary School principal. So really, it's just two pieces which is posting for a permanent position or posting for an interim position. I did uh, also email thoughts to the two options to the Hadley Elementary staff and let people know that I'd be available to speak face-to-face -face or an email. Of the responses that I received, I didn't, it wasn't from everyone in the faculty, but all of those who responded indicated that they recommend hiring an interim principal. Can you just tell us that um, it does feel late for a posting of a principal position now, but what is, what's, what's hiring season for principals? Um, we start to see it about a month ago, yeah. um, but there are postings that are out there and will continue to be out there probably through April. Um, I had said to Annie that um, I know two principals who um, have years of experience um, who would be interested, um, and uh, so we'll see if they do apply. Um, it's, I've also expressed that I feel because Hadley is a very desirable district um, that you, I still feel like even at this point in the year, you would find a, a pretty good um, collection of interest in, in candidates. Um, Annie has expressed that oh, you'd hate to be another district shorthanded on, you know, Right at the very end of the year, again, though, being selfish and thinking of have, you know, having so, you know, that's the kind of thing you have to look at. Um, certainly, I think you could find a very viable candidate for a year intern, whether it's internal or not. I don't know. We have uh, two or three candidates, teachers that do have this. Um, I know one probably is at the end of her career. I'm not sure about the interest in the other ones, um, but even finding somebody that you know it could potentially lead to a permanent position, uh, 
after one year interim. So I think um, you know, that, that's the discussion I've had with the going back from when I first announced it back in, um, during, during February break. Yeah, after February break, when you came back. Annie, can you yep. remind us what, um, historically, what the last principal search, what the process is as far as the different groups that serve sure. as part of it? I wasn't here, but I reviewed all of it. So I had <laughs> immediately had to pull all of that out. So you have a, and which is really a standard search process. So you have a selection committee. It looks a lot like the superintendent search, although at the end of the day, the principal, excuse me, the superintendent hires principals, the school committee hires superintendents. Um, but you have a selection committee. The selection committee is comprised of representatives from the community, parents, staff, um, and you may have school committee representatives on there. Um, it's not a committee that's appointed by the school committee, but you may have school committee representation on there, certainly. Which we um, did, right, for both. We did. And, yeah. uh, and that group typically is responsible for reviewing applications, for vetting those applications, for ensuring. And I would advocate, I, I certainly don't know if this is the case last time I didn't find any rubrics on file, but I always advocate that every single person who vets a, a application has a rubric that they use to ensure that you've met the minimum qualifications and then you score that. Um, we did for the superintendent you, position, I know. Yeah. Did you, we do um, it for the principal? That's what I thought. Yeah. But maybe we don't, you don't have them on file for whatever reason. Um, and then you, um, so that committee typically would then interview, would have a sense of about how many folks they want to send to the next round. And typically the folks who get called in for that first round of interview are referred to as finalists. So everybody, uh, excuse me, semi-finalists. Everybody's an applicant. Then you interview a range of semi-finalists and then you reduce that pool even further, three to five typically. Um, those finalists would then uh, have time to answer questions from the community at a public forum. It's usually standard practice. So they'd speak with the community, they would speak with students, they would speak with faculty, and they may speak with smaller teams of people as well. And, um, and then ultimately, um, I, I believe in using to, the, to every extent possible, using whatever technology you can to, in order to get that feedback from people expeditiously that factors into your evaluation. And then you, the superintendent selects the final candidate for We did do a school show. committee interview, didn't we, for both? Yes, we did. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So the process school is committee two interview. Yes. yes, that was the public forum. Yeah. Isn't that a part of the public forum? I don't know. It's separately. It, we, I, we, I feel it like we a, did. It was a separate school committee. For at least for Mr. Yeah. Beck's position. For both. We did for Mr. Yeah. Udall's. Okay. And that's when their employers find out. Right. And that's when it's. That we did the public. finalist. Yeah. Yeah. We did the finalist introduce. Right. So. Oh, the, right. I mean, could I share that? When I went through the hiring, it was five interviews. Um, started out with the initial interview, and um, then, which was as the semi-finalist, um, and then it was as a finalist, and I was interviewed by the, the uh, student council. Um, I was at a school you know, staff meeting, interviewed by them, um, and then um, there was a site visit, and there were interviews there, and then there was the final, and it was two candidates, and that was the public one that happened over at the cafe, yeah. um, in which the school committee each asked a round of questions, um, and then I got. It. <laughs> yeah. So that was the process. I forgot it about, about the site visit. Process that's, right. Right. Yeah. that's my instinct. Is recalling this. I worry that we are yeah. starting now at almost basically April. Right. Uh, with this. I think you were saying three months. I mean, Two to three months. Yeah. yeah That's a lot to do. And we don't want to rush it to the point where, you know, we don't have adequate representation on any of these um, mm -hmm. yeah. selection committees mm -hmm. or, you know, community involvement. That's what I worry about in terms of making the, the search be starting now. Mm -hmm. I think that's why the, the staff has also expressed, you know, their concerns doing something later than usual. When I went through the process last year, it was March, mm -hmm. beginning of March, and um, it was the beginning of April when the position had been offered. Mm -hmm. So we're almost there now right. at that point. 
and I think that they're, you know, they are concerned. They're obviously heavily invested, and they would rather have um, an opportunity to you know, post it earlier. If you do go to the internal, it gives you that opportunity. And anyone leaving their district and willing to notify their district in the, what would be essentially the May time frame, would, in my view, is kind of suspect. I think it's unethical. Um, and I think in some cases you may have some people self-select out for the very reason you just described, is that they, they can do the, all of the math and say, I'm not signing, I'm not resigning until I sign, I'm not signing until the beginning of May. Um, and so that's notification about 15 days before the fiscal year ends. It's crazy. And is there any so some people may self-select out. Right. We, historically, I think we've done some work on the actual job description and posting. It, mm -hmm. I mean, I, that's mm -hmm. another aspect that I don't know whether we would want to, you know, ensure that we revisit that just to be, right. you know, have another set of eyes on it. But and that takes time. Interim. Interim. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interim. Interim. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, so I just want to repeat. Thank the you both the for your help. Yes. The recommendation of the school committee is um, under special education administration is 1.0 <coughs> coordinator position. 2B. Part time SPED administration with a heavy push for our person of choice. <laughs> and uh, interim HES principal. Yep. Okay. Okay. And <coughs> what's next? Personnel report. Which is in your packet. It's yep. It's light. I've lost it, but it's here. Hmm. Anyone have it? What's it say? I saw it. Um, I think it's Mr. Udall. Mr. Udall? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's yes. the highlight. All. We have a resignation from a paraprofessional, a new hire for a paraprofessional, and a long-term substitute teacher at Hopkins Academy for Art. And how, how are we doing on replacing our retiring teachers at Hopkins? We have three. So we have uh, our final candidate three. in French. She is knows. Our final candidate in French is meeting with me this week, yeah. that, that, who was recommended. We've wrapped up. Well, it was Mr. Beck, Ms. Brain, and Mr. Foreman mm -hmm. who did awesome. interviews for band. Mm -hmm. I believe those are wrapped up and they'll be sending recommendations my okay. way. I That's, think they just started today. No, they did some already. Yeah. yeah, so then they're There's ending. They, was, they uh, did, they, I know they've already, yeah. I know they've already done one of those and they also did additional ones. Um, when I say recommendations, it's ultimately the principal hires all staff. I don't. I hire principals. Um, but uh, I meet the people and show them where they are on the salary schedule and, and finalize the offer. So I anticipate we'll be moving very quickly on band, and I'm assuming you mean school psychologist for the or last position at Ms. Hopkins? Ms. Judith is retiring this year, isn't she? Not this year, no. Oh, not this year? She's oh, not. Thought, okay. uh, but our school psychologist position, we had Pat and some other folks sent uh, two finalists to me, and there were some teachers and additional staff who wanted to participate in the interviews. They couldn't make all the initials, so they'll be with me in the second round. And that is happening this week. I think it's this week. Thank you. We're on to the public comment period. Anything? No? OK. Chris, your turn. Okay, uh, so we have three reports, one that was in your meeting package and two that were left on your desk tonight. Um, you can take them in any particular order, I guess. Uh, we can start with the expense report, that's the big one. I know you probably didn't have much of a time to review it, um, since you just got it uh, before the meeting, but uh, basically, it's kind of the same thing. I, I probably could have just put a recording of what I said last month on here, and everyone would have been fine. Um, spending is still going according to schedule. Um, I started to look at some of the encumbrances that we had. Um, one example, if you just go to page 8 on the report and look at the electricity, this is the kind of cleaning up that we're uh, doing at this point in time. Um, the electricity, you can see we've spent about $62,000 so far this year on electricity. 
we have another 58,000 encumbered for the final three months of the year. Obviously, we'd really have to work hard to spend $58,000 in the last three months of the year. So we're reducing those encumbrances, which essentially frees up the money um, to be used. So uh, Mary and I sat down today and went through them, and I have a whole listing of um, you know, encumbrances that we want to reduce the amounts on. And uh, we'll be doing that this week. So your next report will look a little bit differently as far as that goes. Um, other than that, really, there's not not really a heck of a lot to talk about in the report. Sorry, it's, that's okay. It's just not that. That's exciting. good. Yeah. So the percent used and encumbrances seem on target for you at this point of with the adjustments that you're making. They do, yeah. And we've made some adjustments, you know, just transferring budget amounts around um, yeah. to bring uh, negative balances back up to zero. There's a few more on this report. Um, the owners of those accounts are aware that you know, something needs to be done to bring them back up to zero. Um, and we're looking at encumbrances on those accounts as well because there's a lot of money encumbered. And a lot of times what happens is you put a purchase order in for a purchase and the price doesn't come in anywhere near what the original cost was thought to be. Um, due to a number of things, you know, they, they didn't have that particular item, it was cheaper, you, you know, it all of a sudden went on sale when you placed the order that it wasn't before. And that purchase order stays open for a while just in case there's additional items coming, maybe they were back order or something like that. So they keep them open for a while. Mary and I are looking at that as well just to make sure that we don't have open POs basically sitting there looking like the money's tied up when in reality it is a bill. Mm -hmm. so, um, but yeah, everything everything really looks in pretty good shape, I have to say. Um, there's you know, nothing that I'm concerned about. Yeah. I had one question about the buses and the, the whole bus, not just the chassis, that whole conversation we had earlier in the year. Yes. Will that all be encumbered in this fiscal year? Uh, well, that is actually a town expense, okay. um, so so we don't have to worry about encumbering or anything. Um, okay. The smaller, the I think they called it a mid bus with right. the whole chassis body mm -hmm. slash uh, yeah uh, confusion <laughs> whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yeah. Um, that has been ordered. It should be in in May, and then the town will you know will pay that. Okay. The other one was money that was just approved at the town meeting mm -hmm. last year and um, it, we have um, placed the ad, it's on the state website, we are accepting requests for the bid specs right now, um, but there's no way they're going to have that to us by June 30th, so that one will carry over into next year. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and we did state in these bid specs that we wanted a 2017 body slash 2017 chassis. Mm -hmm. I suppose we didn't list tires, uh, seats, and everything else, but we're, we're assuming at this point we're safe. So, um, at, at least we're covered as far as that goes. Okay, thanks. Um, then we have the revolving accounts report. Um, again, you know, not too much really. The lunch account, you can see the, the negative balance is decreasing, which is nice to see. Um, and that is with an increase in the negative balances on individual accounts that I know in Hopkins were about thousand dollars. We have about a thousand dollars in negative balances. Elementary <laughs> school is around four hundred. So, you know, if you factor those in, we're not in really that bad shape. Mm -hmm. you know, I guess a negative balance can't really be considered good shape, but it's not an unusual situation. Um, and just an FYI item for the lunch program, um, we just had it on it in the last couple of weeks. I sat in on the exit interview last Thursday. Um, it really went very well. I mean, there were a couple of, you know, as she put it, kind of nitpicky items, um, just like uh, they needed starch vegetables at the salad bar. Um, you know, that type of thing. So it wasn't a financial audit, it was a nutritional audit? Um, the only financial, uh, I guess, I don't even remember what some of the questions were. We went through the questionnaire at the beginning and they had a bunch of financial type questions. They looked at printouts of the accounts um, just to see how the spending was going, how the, how the revenues were going. Um, but it wasn't a financial audit. No, it was really kind of a, a comprehensive food services audit with just a very minor portion on the financial side. And the starch vegetable in the mm -hmm. salad bar is a potato or corn? Peas. Uh, I asked the same question. So, <laughs> peas and beans, um, apparently. So. Oh, 
Um, Darn. That was my same question. I'm like, boy, starch vegetable, that's not easy. If I recall, there were some questions in terms of, you're right, it was a very, very small financial piece, but their primary concern is around eligibility to ensure that around low-income eligibility oh. for the lunch program, mm -hmm. that we're administering that correctly, that we're ensuring that those who are eligible have access to that program, and that we can track those we've awarded eligibility to to existing in the district. Right. So this is a big hot spot in another district around us right now. So I'm sure Diane breathed a sigh of relief really at, at how well the exit interview went, as did I, quite honestly. You know, it's always nice to see that. You know, they always have a few very minor items, you know, like the salad bar issue, um, but they're really very, very small. So we will be getting the final report from them, I guess, in, within the next month, I would assume. Um, and one of the items they did mention and I needed to just pass that on to you was that they did recommend again a, a lunch charge policy. Um, oh. Oh. Lunch. What do you mean? Oh. Lunch what? What, we, mean? what? What's that mean? Remember we oh. didn't ever get back to that lunch charging policy and so if mm -hmm. if people owe money or don't have money what are, what do we allow them to eat and for how long? We never Oh. We need to get back to that. I'm yeah, sorry. That, that's obviously did you say, oh, just like I did <laughs> when they said that? I just said, okay. And okay. I wrote it down and that was it. We'll get right on that, right? Sounds see? Different. And I see that um, a strong basketball season equals a lot of chocolate no chip kidding. cookie sales, uh, yeah. doubling the account between yeah, I mean, really, for last, basketball. Say, four months, it, it pretty much doubled, yeah. It's a lot of cookies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, lunch charging. And the last item is the grant report. Again, um, basically the grants are being spent as expected. Um, the circuit breaker again may or may not be fully spent. It wasn't last year, and again we can carry over about eighty-eight thousand dollars. So we're already all set. And we we actually want to, don't we? Uh, didn't we, like we didn't sure. we build in uh, some of that? It's always nice to mm -hmm. have that kind of your back pocket just in case. Yeah. Um, Title one again, that can be carried over as well. I don't really see us carrying over anything there. Um, just a, a, an explanation for you, the Title two a feature quality at the top of the page. Uh, basically, you've seen that all year with nothing spent. What we have is um, there's a teacher salary that's paid out of Title one, partially paid out of Title one. Once that amount is finished, it's gonna switch over to the Title two a So um, that'll probably happen. And Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. I want her pants. And that's, that's pretty much it. Generators? Uh, generators, they, they have ordered them. Should be should be coming at any time. I actually uh, requested last week some kind of timeline because they said it would take a couple of months for the generator order to, uh, to come in. Well, they probably placed it in January, so it's probably time for them to come in at this point in time. I haven't gotten a response yet, so I'll probably have to reach out again. But I'm, I'm still expecting that they will be completed you know, between now and in the summer you know, for some items that they probably want to wait until the students weren't here to take care of. Okay. Eventually, that project yeah. will be done. Yes. It would be nice. By the time you leave the school committee. Yeah, maybe. Um, school committee reports. I start. Uh, we, uh, Paul and I, met with Edwin Matusko, chair of the CPA committee, Jerry Devine, chair of capital planning, David Nixon, and Annie to talk about the Fields Project and talk about whether uh, the Fields Project is eligible for CPA. Um, since that meeting, when we ag all agreed we thought it was, mm -hmm. Edwin has gone to the state and has had confirmation that mm -hmm. yes, indeed, it's an eligible project for CPA. Um, we provided Edwin with the information and plans and surveys that he needed to get that information from Boston. And there was um, discussion at that meeting of how quickly we could get to town meeting and ask for CPA funds for phase one. If we could make it to May town meeting, that would be better for the construction sequencing. 
seasonal, seasonally. Um, but everyone agreed, and I think the CPA committee agreed from the last correspondence you had from mm -hmm. Edwin, last conversation you had from Edwin, that um, we would rather have a well-formulated argument for town meeting than a, than a rushed one. And so we'll see mm -hmm. if it goes in May or the fall. Has the, has the school committee gone to the CPA meeting? If they have not, I think they would like to see um, school representatives there, is what I was saying. Oh, really? Yes. Okay, because we asked about that, and Edwin said it was not necessary. Um, someone else on the committee said okay. that they would like the school committee to follow the That's same procedure fine. that we were just, else does. We were just going through what the chair said, but mm -hmm. it's, I think it's fine for us to go there. Do we know I, when I, and... I do not. I was just advised. The next meeting will probably not be until September. Does that sound about right? That they typically they I, I prepare don't, for. I um, don't know. I know they met last week. I don't know. They prepare items for the warrant typically mm -hmm. for town meeting. That's their primary function. I'm not saying it's the only thing that they do. So they review requests um, and uh, then uh, vet those requests and decide what they're going to recommend for the warrant, for the town warrant. Um, so I believe in the fall is when they typically would meet again. Right. I'll call Edwin. You know, we, we specifically asked at that meeting whether we needed to go, and we were told it was not necessary because we just had the meeting. But if the members of CPA want school committee at a meeting, happy to be there. So do you know if it's going to be on the warrant for me? Did he tell uh, you if it was going to be on the warrant? I think he, um, last I read, the conversation mm -hmm. you had was that they were still trying, but they weren't promising, correct? Yes, so it, I have not heard anything from CPA, um, excuse me, I've heard from Edwin since the last CPA meeting, and uh, Edwin had indicated that, um, that it felt rushed. We did respond to that and say this was something that we had discussed uh, with Terry Devine and with David Nixon. And okay, yeah, I, see, I, see, I see, I understand the conversation, I know that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. All right, I'll call Edwin. Uh, I think that was a oh, budget presentation. Okay, I think I'm done. Am I done? No. When you, will you talk about the budget, budget presentation to the Finance Committee? Certainly. Uh, they were wonderful. So I presented the FY17 budget to the Finance Committee at their request on Saturday at 9 o'clock in the morning. The Finance Committee was attentive. They asked excellent questions. Mr. Nixon was incredibly helpful also in some of the questions that came up at that meeting. Specifically, uh, one was why we weren't using school choice monies to pay for the grease traps. Uh, David Nixon was helpful in pointing out that, and he spoke understanding that uh, it was his opinion. It's not for him to give recommendations, certainly, on what fin the Finance Committee does or what school committee chooses to do, but he did say that it, um, using town funding to maintain the town's assets is, is perfectly logical. Um, there were a few other questions, specifically as they pertain to school choice and those funds. Um, and then there were some questions about programs and the programs we've built and why we built those. Um, I explained some of the cost avoidance that we've experienced as a result of building a program in special education and not to mention the added benefit of keeping children in district. Um, and that was the, the extent of the conversation. They don't make any decisions or they certainly didn't in front of anybody who was there presenting their budget. But it was a great meeting. And um, I indicated in an email, a follow-up email, I thanked them for their time, certainly said I'm willing to ha answer questions and encourage them to talk to the school committee as well. Great. Thank you for doing that. No problem. Heather. Okay, so two things. Unit D negotiations, um, still underway, still in process. No new updates since our last meeting, actually. So um, I hope to have another update for our next meeting, but at this time, there's no news. Mm -hmm. um, survey, parent and community survey. So I have a draft um, timeline, really an outline, to move this forward towards the April meeting with uh, getting questions out to this group from the prior survey and the new ones that we know um, have been suggested being added by the end of this month, so by the 31st, uh, that's this week, and <laughs> getting feedback from you individually uh, by the 8th of April. 
so that we can um, finalize that as a set to be included in next month's packet, mm -hmm. and we can deliberate here at the meeting um, on the 20, or have it out to you guys uh, on the 20th. And I know I wanted to later in the meeting talk about the April meeting date, because um, I won't be here, and I don't know, I know we need to have a quorum, and whether we can shift it or not, or somebody else can uh, take on that presentation in April if we have a quorum and we keep that date. The only other thing in the interim that I do want to um, go back to what we did last time is we're going to want to solicit for some parent volunteers, mm -hmm. both in terms of reviewing the survey as kind of like a focus group, um, but also in terms of assisting me with the um, data analysis and presentation of the final report. Um, I did share that final report uh, to the CPAC group, I know, earlier in the year, and so I would welcome any support in terms of um, just making sure that we're presenting the data and analyzing it um, accurately and in a way that makes sense for interpreting, you know, what next. I'm sorry, you said you'll get the survey out by March 31st. Do you want comments? By April 8th. 8th, and then you're, we're going to also talk about it in... Open meeting. Yes. Open meeting. So the comments I would like back are individually. Yep. Um, so you can get those directly to me. I can compile all of that and bring those considerations then to the meeting. And then you'd hope that the survey itself is out sometime early, mid-May? Early, early mid-May, yes. Okay. Thanks. Yes, we have approval on it um, depending on when the April meeting is held. You know, it's um, pretty quick to get it into the survey monkey tool and get it out. But there may need to be some prep work in terms of ensuring that we agree upon who it's being sent to. Right. Um, last time it was sent to uh, folks who had left the district within the last uh, couple of years that we had a time yep. frame around it. Mm -hmm. And I just I want to make sure that that's information we can easily get to mm -hmm. in order to distribute it um, right on time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Roby. I don't have anything, any news. I don't know that there are any changes on the prioritization of the capital plan, so the I guess I don't know what this is. One of the reasons I put that in there is because um, part of what came up at that meeting was the meeting that we had with CPA was a question about have these things been prioritized? Um, have these things been prioritized? Has the school committee prioritized the capital plan? So, um, because Paul was also a part of that discussion, mm -hmm. very specifically at that meeting, either Mr. Devine or David Nixon or asked Jerry. the question, Jerry Devine asked the question, has the school committee prioritized the items on the capital plan? Um, yes, I know across years we have, but yes, in a given but fiscal year, there are several items. Oh, okay. Is the school committee interested in further? Because um, that's that's a lot to ask. Prioritizing. Within right. a given fiscal year. Okay. Right. So when he said, have you prioritized it, I said we have by year, but we hadn't by projects Good within projects. the year. Right. Yeah. Right. I think there's been some discussion, but not yeah. extensive. Is that something you guys could work on and suggest um, to us? Sure. I think I think you need to decide about the computer stuff being on a capital right plan. Right. Not that it's not capital, but it's not something that you want to finance. Right. But we also have never yeah, we, we also have trouble budget. putting it in the operating right. because we don't. Right, but so. I think that's the that's the big thing that really has to be. Yep determine how that's going to actually get done in a reasonable financial way. Yeah. Uh, and CES, I have no, nothing to report. We meet on Wednesday. Okay. Um, we did our action item. Are we done? Mm -hmm. Except for well, the next meeting. The school calendar was in the Oh, yeah. And it was in the calendar just so you'd have a final copy. We that don't have to vote. vote it? No, you already voted. We did. Yeah. Okay. It simply and so it's you have time to. May, yeah. um, may I ask if there's any strong opinions from the school committee? Signs that Fred recommended for the parking lot, park at your own risk at Hopkins Academy. It's Attorney awesome. Dupre has mm -hmm. strongly suggested that we put these up. That's good. I would okay. Agree. Yeah. Okay. Great. You cannot do the 25th? Is Correct. April. It's the and pleasure. I can't call in either. Okay. Because I'm on a plane. Fine. 
<laughs> so I didn't know if um, the oh, so that are you out that whole week? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, I didn't know if the following Monday would be easily able to be shifted, or if uh, Yanni, you mentioned that there needs to be the budget presentation. Right. And mm -hmm. if as long as it happens before town meeting, which is May 5th, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't do the second. Okay. I'll be in D.C. So options are the 18th or go without Heather. 18th is school 18th. vacation. I can't do the 18th. Yeah. During spring break. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. We usually don't meet it during the school vacation. Okay. Are you on a plane, like, headed out or coming back? Headed out. Yeah, so I, I just do it without me then if you if you know you've got a quorum. Mm -hmm. So you got your available in there? Um, I am on the 25th. Okay. Yes. Good. So that will be our reorganization meeting where we assign you all the subcommittee tasks. That's right. Oh. And so while Heather's not here, it's good to, just to let you know ahead of time every committee is yours every now. Every subcommittee. Yes. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, let's talk about who can represent the survey item too. Uh, I don't know who, Mary. I know you and I worked on it last time. If you're happy to do that. Comfortable that representing sure. that. That'd be great. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Great. Thank you. Okay. Do we have anything else? No. I make a motion to close this meeting. Thank you. Seconded. All right. Everyone in favor? I'm in favor. Aye. Look at that. Look at that, people.